this is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek. And today we're going to be talking uh, with Cliff Smith. He's the business manager of uh, Roofers Union Local in Los Angeles and has been involved in a long struggle, not only for worker and union rights in his union, but also in the working class as a whole. And we're going to be talking about the, his history and the lessons for today. So welcome to Workweek, Cliff. Thank you, Steve. So Cliff, why don't you talk about how you got involved in the labor movement and what, what started you out in your struggle for justice in the labor movement? What got me involved was just being a member of the working class and uh, trying to get active, uh, in, you know, in, in my, uh, where I work at, in my community as well. As well. And what were some of the experiences that you had um, as a trade unionist, as a worker that um, you looked at as critical in, in fighting for workers' defense and fighting to organize the labor movement, uh, you know, with unions and, and other organizations? I was a member of the Teamsters working at UPS um, in the mid-90s. You know, we were working overnight loading trailers in uh, the UPS facility in New Jersey. Um, for eight dollars an hour on a part-time schedule, I was a member of the United Food and Commercial Workers, delivering uh, produce um, in New Jersey for seven dollars and fifty cents an hour, and you know I couldn't, I couldn't make ends meet on those, you know, on, on those paychecks with very limited benefits and irregular hours, um, and these were union positions. So it was just constantly a, a, a fight to try to raise the standards and improve the conditions and bumping heads with uh, management, uh, occasionally bumping heads with union representatives um, and then getting into the buildings trades where I made my career and uh, coming up through the rank and file, you know, as a roofer. And the, the building trades have been a core of, of union organizing in the United States, in the history of the United States, actually. There have been militant struggles. Uh, one of the biggest was the sheetrock workers in Los Angeles uh, that took place, uh, a mass strike. Um, building trades workers have, uh, uh, although in the United States there are a large number of, of immigrant workers in, in the building trades, uh, yet, yet it seems like the building trades leadership are not reflective of that, of even their membership. And uh, I know during the uh, racist uh, attacks by Trump, uh, attacking immigrants, attacking Latinos, attacking Blacks, uh, there was very little opposition from the national union leadership, including workers who represent a large number of these workers in the building trades. How do you explain that? Well, yeah, the, the history of, you know, the, the labor movement in general in the United States and maybe particularly in the buildings trades is uh, a good old boy um, click, um, white male uh, dominated leadership, um, anti-democratic in a lot of ways, um, definitely opposed to uh, oppressed nationalities, immigrant and uh, you know, diversity. Um, I think that uh, conditions have forced some changes or maybe only, you know, in where I'm at in the Southwest, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to take place. Um, in my local, we have about a thousand members and probably 80% of them are native Spanish speaking. Uh, many of them have family members that are uh, undocumented, um, or maybe themselves. And it, you know, creates a lot of, uh, issues on the job as well as in the direct communities. And there's been a fight in the trade unions against uh, segregation, against racism in the trade unions and unions are, uh, are, can be a critical vehicle in fighting racism, uh, systemic racism, racist by the, uh, the, uh, on the job. Uh, there have been an epidemic of hanging noose incidents on, on construction sites in the United States. What, what role should the unions play in fighting uh, racism uh, in, in, 
in uh, construction and in all jobs. I mean, it seems like the unions in this period of uh, increasing racist attacks and uh, a fascist movement, the critical nature of the unions uh, becomes even more apparent. Well, you know, our, uh, our primary slogan in the labor movement is an injury to one is an injury to all. And the, the understanding behind that is that our only strength comes from our, our unity and our solidarity as workers, as, as working people um, across all lines. And if we allow for racism or any other types of divisions uh, within, within our ranks, within the working class, we're doing our, our boss's job for them. We're, we're weakening ourselves. We're, you know, we, can, we cannot fight a, a war with one hand tied behind our back and so the only way to to maximize our you know our capacity is to have the broadest absolute unity among all workers. So you know racism is a direct threat to that. It's a cancer. It needs to be uh, fought consciously and intentionally. And for organized labor, for for the union movement and leadership, you know we need to take that fight head on. And how would you do that? Because I know in my Union, for example, I was a member of the uh, stationary engineers that were hanging nooses put up at facilities. I joined together with black uh, members of my union and tried to fight it. But uh, even in our local, they didn't want to talk about it. Uh, they didn't want to make it a political issue. And it, for the unions and the labor council, the labor movement to take it as a serious issue. It seems like there's some big obstacles for the to get the unions to say we're going to take this seriously and we're going to organize against it and educate the members that it's unacceptable and that's the key is that it has to be unacceptable and you know any any leader any any uh person that's in a position of leadership or or authority or influence that that doesn't treat it as unacceptable is not on the side of the members it's not on the side of the workers and is definitely not representing the interests of working people and um that needs to be exposed and those people, whether individually or, you know, more broadly, they, they need to be, uh, need to be made to be seen as part of the problem. Um, you know, we, we, there cannot be exceptions. There cannot, I mean, you, you said it cannot be tolerated and that's, that's the way that it has to be treated. Anything that divides workers and makes us fight against each other is our enemy. And we need to operate on that principle. And this pandemic that we are going through now in the United States and internationally, it seems that one result of uh, the pandemic is, is that this system that we have in this country has not protected people. Over 800,000 people have died. We still don't have masks uh, for people. We still don't have testing even. Uh, in California, the richest state in the country, uh, and nationally, Biden did not order tests. We're, we're still behind two years after the pandemic. Um, and uh, it seems in this economically that the billionaires, Bezos and, and uh, Elon Musk, they've made out like bandits in the midst of this pandemic. What does that say about this system that, that people are profiting at the top and, and working people are really against the law? Well, I mean, this is, this is the story of capitalism, the story of the labor struggle. You know, since it's history, it's a disgrace that... Uh, the wealthiest country on the planet in history uh, is unable to provide for the, the health of, of, of its uh, citizens and residents. Um, that uh, workers, uh, especially you know those of us that were classified as essential workers, are just put out to the mercy of a you know a worldwide contagion, um, left to our own devices. You know, while, as you say, the, the, these uh, monopoly capitalists continue to profit hand over fist is, is, is a disgrace. Um, and it shows that the, uh, the, the, the health care system, which is for profit, um, cannot be uh, relied upon to, to serve the health needs of working people and that there has to be a, uh, a different system that serves the, uh, the, the healthcare needs of working people. And even in California and nationally, the Democrats said that they were healthcare for all, yet uh, it seems like Medicare for all or a national health plan is, is absent from the debate at this point uh, in, 
in the United States. Even in California, we still have privatized health care. We still have people being charged for tests, uh, being uh, not really being covered. Um, what is going to be necessary to get these basic necessities, national health care for all working people in this country? Well, certainly, uh, profit motive has to be removed from, from health care. You know, uh, it, it's not health care if it's a for-profit industry. It, it's something else. It, it's a business. It's, a, it's an enterprise. And that's not in the interests of working people. And, you know, as you're pointing out, this pandemic makes it more clear than ever. We need a health care system that prioritizes health care. And working people cannot rely on pharmaceutical industries or insurance companies or politicians that are in their pockets to uh, provide for our health needs. And while this uh, pandemic is going on and apparently they can't get uh, uh, this, uh, the, what they'd like, some of the uh, monies for uh, childcare and other things, they did pass a $770 billion budget one year for the military. What does it say about this system, American capitalism, that we're spending trillions on war, yet we can't even take care of people? They're homeless people, people on the streets, people can't get health care, uh, kids can't go to college, they can't afford to go to college. Um, it seems like these contradictions are growing in, in the United States. Well, uh, for, for one, it says that the people making these decisions uh, do not understand where the actual threats and dangers are. To, to the masses of the, of the people, um, you know, there, there's no uh, foreign military enemy that, uh, you know, endangers us. The, the threats and dangers to us are attacks on our health. Um, the 800,000 people that have died from the pandemic, um, as well as political attacks on our democracy and our rights to organize, um, our rights to vote, uh, women's right to control their reproductive health, um, the attacks on democracy and uh, the, the, the pandemic are much greater threats than any military threat. And this growing threat of a war uh, against China, blaming China, blaming Russia, it seems that the deeper this economic crisis grows, the more the threat uh, by the corporations and the, and the politicians to say that the problem is China, the problem is Russia. What is going on? Uh, it's the same old story of trying to find uh, some scapegoat and to export our uh, national problems, you know, rather than to resolve them, you know, where they're at internally. The greatest threat to working people in America is, is the ruling class in America, not uh, some, some other country. And it, it seems that the election of Biden and the Democrats has not stopped the rise of uh, fascist movement in the United States. It seems to be growing. Uh, they're organizing, taking over local school boards. They're using the pandemic to organize politically. And this rise of fascism, do you see it as a real threat to working people in this country and internationally? And, and how should workers deal with this growth of fascism in the United States? The rise of fascism is, is our most uh, severe threat. Um, it's, you know, as I said, the attack on democracy, which, you know, that's exactly what fascism is. And it's a, you know, it's a, um, an expression of, of capitalism in its, in its, uh, in its decline. And whether it's a democratic administration or a Republican administration, capitalism is in decline and, and fascism is, you know, it's, that, that's the direction that it's headed into. Um, the defeat of Trump was important to slow it down, but as you said, the Democrats cannot solve these problems. There has been a fight for labor parties in the United States, William Silvis actually, uh, before the Civil War uh, was fighting for a labor party. But the United States uh, has not been able to form a workers party, a labor party. And yet it seems like that is a critical necessity for workers to organize. Uh, and defend themselves. Um, maybe you can talk about how you came to the conclusion about the need for a workers' party, a labor party, and and how that would should be organized. What workers should do to to build such a party? First, to say that it's necessary that um, there's no organization in the United States that represents the interests of of working people as a class. Um, 
and it's it's difficult because of the uh, the arrangement of the political uh, the 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 playing field that that we're on in the United States. Um, everything is winner take all. Um, you don't have a parliamentary uh, system like in uh, many European countries where you can vote for a, you know a, maybe a, a minority party and still um, have some type of um, piece of the pie you know, in, in, a, in a representative government. So, you know, we're in a position at national elections where if you try to uh, run as an independent, you, you risk being a spoiler. And so that, that has to be taken into consideration. You know, we, we don't wanna jump out of the frying pan into the fire, but at the same time, we cannot just be at the mercy of the Democratic Party. Um, we, we need to form our own independent political organization. And so I think it's a question of exactly how to, uh, how to bring that in, you know, into being. And I think that's been the obstacle why in the United States, it, it hasn't been able to, uh, to really materialize. Um, I, I think that there's a failure on, on the part of activists and organizers, you know, whether they're in labor or whether they're in some other formation to navigate the, these uh, complex, uh, you know, the, the landscape that we're in. Um, you know, I have some thoughts about it, but I think, you know, fundamentally, we just have to start with that it's necessary and that there's no other way out. Well, you have run as an independent uh, for a workers' party. Why don't you talk about how that happened, what, what lessons you had, and is uh, maybe as a, a vehicle to, to other trade unions, other workers to take similar action. Well, that's that that's what I think is is the way to uh, to begin building is from the ground up. You know, just like anything else in in construction industry, you have to start from the foundation. I don't think that we can build a a nationwide workers political party out of whole cloth from the top down. And you know, I see some people trying to you know, uh, put that forward. And I think it's grandstanding. I think we have to run uh, local election campaigns in strategic places where you could take on the Democratic Party head on without risking that the Republicans are going to uh, gain power, that fascism is going to gain power. And, you know, there are cities in the United States where independent or pro working class uh, local candidates have been able to win um, in Seattle, in Newark, in Jackson, Mississippi, um, and some other places. And I think that those are, you know, instrumental and, and it's by fighting at, at these local levels that we can uh, gain power, that we can put forward a national program. I mean, you look at the election of Kashama Sawant, in Seattle as an independent socialist uh, candidate coming out of the Occupy movement. And this is the first city in the country to put a $15 minimum wage into, uh, in, into their city's um, legislation. And now it's a national conversation because of the election of a council person. Um, so I, I ran for city council in my district in Los Angeles uh, a couple years ago. And the city clerk made sure to purge my signatures and kept me off the ballot. But you know, we we put our program forward for uh, people's democracy, for community control over the police, for a twenty-five dollar minimum wage, for um, women's shelters, um, and we're continuing to organize, you know, uh, in the community on those uh, on those issues. So, you know, whether it's myself or, you know, somebody else is, is not so important to me who the candidate is. It's about building the organization, building uh, power and strength in the community and challenging the Democrats and attacking them where we can take power. And of course, in California, it's a Democratic uh, executive, Democratic legislature. They have a two-thirds majority, supermajority. Most of the cities are controlled by Democrats. So it's really a democratic run state, you know, so they can't blame it really on the Republicans. Uh, no, they have no excuses. California. <laughs> yep, they have no nowhere to hide. Now, the other issue is 
the question of workers linking up internationally. There's going to be an Amazon global action on January 12th on Bezos' birthday uh, in the um, Los Angeles. Uh, there are struggles of Amazon workers. It's all over the world globally. Um, the need for workers in the United States to link up with workers internationally. We're fighting the same multinationals of same capitalists globally. Uh, how do you see that taking place and what should workers in the United States do organizationally in, in order to link up with workers around the world and take joint actions? Well, just like you know, the issue you raised before about fighting against racism, we, we can't fight with just part of our army. Um, workers are workers wherever we are. And as you're pointing out, the, the model of uh, Amazon is, you know, uh, it, it's international. It, there's no borders that restrict Amazon or Walmart or an, any of these uh, monopoly internationalist companies. And so workers cannot allow ourselves to be uh, contained by uh, geographic boundaries. We, we can't fight Amazon in one city or in one country. Amazon is global and we have to fight them on those terms. So the, uh, the Roofers Local 36, my union, um, we're affiliated to the World Federation of Trade Unions. We're the first United States trade union since 1949 to be affiliated to the WFTU. Um, and so we're part of a international labor organization with over 100 million union members in 130 countries. Um, we, we support this uh, class oriented and democratic militant trade union federation and the, the labor unions in other countries that are going on strike against Amazon that are uh, mobilizing directly to, to take on uh, Jeff Bezos. You know, we stand shoulder to shoulder with them and the same way we do with the workers in Bessemer, Alabama or in Seattle who are fighting against Amazon. But in the United States, we haven't managed to crack, crack that nut and organize any uh, trade union at any Amazon facilities. But we, we do stand in solidarity with uh, the, the unions and workers in other countries that are organized already against Amazon. And one of the uh, historical lessons of uh, organizing the United States in the 1930s uh, was that uh, GM, a lot of these companies were fighting the unions. They did not want to be organized. And it was only when workers, uh, thousands of workers surrounded the factories, they occupied the factories through a mass mobilization where these industries organized. Uh, and do you see the same thing as a, a policy in the United States that really to organize Amazon is going to require similar actions to the ones that were taken in the 1930s? Well, I mean, what works, works. <laughs> you know, it, it, since, since that time, since the CIO withdrew from the World Federation of Trade Unions in 1949, the percentage of union membership in the United States has declined from a, a third of all workers in the private sector to 6%. So somewhere along the way, we, we've lost our way. And no amount of uh, rhetoric or no amount of explaining can, can hide those, those facts. Uh, the struggles that took place in the, in the 30s to build our unions, to build the labor movement, you know, as you're saying, we, we can see how they managed to, to organize, how they built power, how they built these institutions. And we've, we've fallen away from that. Um, in the last very recent memory, there's, there's been some encouraging signs and, and we've seen results from it. Um, but, you know, it, it needs to be on a much greater scale. And again, this brings us back to having a clear uh, leadership with a program in the interests of the working class that's not compromised. And David Van Dusen and the Vermont AFL-CIO have called for a, a rank and file approach to organizing within the states and, and nationally. And there's gonna be an afl cio convention in uh, June in Philadelphia. He, his uh, union, his federation also said there should be a general strike against any attempted coup in the United States. And the 
uh, Richard Trumka, the head of the AFL-CIO, said it was Im improper to talk about that. That's off the table. They couldn't even discuss it and ruled it out of order. They went ahead and passed it. It seems like uh, within the AFL-CIO, the struggle in the AFL-CIO over uh, rank and file control, workers taking action against fascism is going to be a, and should be a political issue. Do you, do you think that that's an issue for the AFL-CIO? Uh, I think that even the Democratic Party at this point is recognizing that the direct fight against fascism is is the the front line of you know of any political struggle um for you know former uh afl cio president rich trumka or any other labor leader to say that workers should not be uh prepared to to fight fascism directly uh at at every level is is completely uh, irresponsible um you know what took place a year ago on january 6th um you know it, it shows that there's there's no going back um these people are are prepared they're organized they're armed um they're continuing to mobilize and uh you know the we're, we're not in the world of of civil discourse um you know th this is uh this is a fight for the future of of democracy and the working class and uh there, there's not going to be settling it you know um in 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 a courtroom or in in a in a, in a legislative chamber um it's a fight for power and one of the issues about the uh afl cio their international operations the solidarity center uh is getting 75 million dollars a year from the national endowment for democracy and one of the reasons the uh, the AFL-CIO has the positions it does internationally is that it has gone along with uh, Democrats who supported NAFTA. It's gone along with uh, privatization of industries around the world, uh, which is what U.S. corporations want, U.S. billionaires want. Um, how do you see the uh, the fight in the AFL-CIO? Like, for example, do you believe that they should be taking $75 million a year for their international operations? And should that be an issue for workers in this country? Most workers don't even know what the AFL-CIO is doing internationally. This issue of internationalism, of fighting not only privatization, deregulation in the United States, but internationally seems to be a critical issue for the defense of working people. Well, I have to confess that, you know, I'm, I'm one of those workers that doesn't have a lot of information about, you know, what the AFL-CIO is doing internationally. The United States government does not have a history of representing the, the side of working people. And so, you know, I, to, to collaborate with uh, an agency that, that doesn't represent your interest to me, like is, it, it is not a good place to begin. I don't see that the AFL-CIO uh, needs to have that type of partnership. I think, you know, any international partnership that the United States union movement should be in should be with unions in other countries, the United States government represents monopoly capitalism and imperialism. Uh, it represents high finance and Wall Street and militarism. Uh, I don't see that there's any expression of democracy in it. I don't see that there's any concern for the interests of working people in the United States or in any part other part of the world uh, in the United States government. So, uh, you know, it, I, I can't see any anything positive coming from that. And on unifying workers in this country and building a workers movement, building towards a, a labor party, how do you see that taking place? Because workers are spread out, we're in a pandemic, we can't even meet together. And yet workers need to have unity, they need to be debating, discussing, we need a democratic trading movement where there can be a discussion debate in the labor movement about what, the, what we face, the issues we face. How do you see building a democratic movement. I know the teachers as Wildcats, they use social media um, and workers are getting their information out. Um, in the way of communication, there's no labor channel in the United States. There are a lot of labor struggles going on, Kellogg's and, and Deere, but there's no, there doesn't seem to be a vehicle for a debate, discussion, and struggle with the, with the labor movement as a whole. Well, I think that uh, one of the first places to start is that uh, People that are interested in trying to build a labor party or uh, an independent workers political organization need to look uh, 
not only inside the the labor movement formally or, or at the job sites or within the trade unions because you know as we're saying the the unions representing only six percent of workers in the private sector that means that over 90 percent of workers are not in a labor movement or are not in a trade union they're not organized in in terms of uh workers organizations so we need to be engaging working people outside of the job site outside of the the trade union outside of the labor movement in the community and you know despite the pandemic and despite all the uh the problems that we faced in the last two years we've seen one of the largest mass uprisings across the country in history fighting against police brutality fighting against institutional and systemic racism and hundreds of thousands of people have been in the streets constantly for, I mean, at least since the murder of George Floyd. And, you know, that's resulted in some important and historic uh, victories with the uh, conviction of the police officer and now a second police officer in Minnesota. Um, so there's, I think, no shortage of opportunities to engage working people directly in the street despite you know the the conditions that we're in but i think that people that are in the labor movement in in the trade union movement that are interested in building a working class party need to uh be trying to carry that program not only on the job or not only in the union movement and i think that that's been one of the shortcomings of uh previous attempts to build a labor party has been that has been too much focused on inside the the labor movement formally and the history of mass struggle the united states has a tremendous history and i think one of the most important developments in the post war period was 2006 when a million workers immigrant workers latino workers joined together in the streets uh, for immigrant rights for workers rights uh, that could have been an opportunity for the unions <laughs> to join with them and recruit them into the trade union movement. And as you say, the Black Lives Matter mass protest, another opportunity for organized labor to join with them. So you, you see that as critical really for transforming the labor movement. I mean, if these workers who marched in 2006 had been joined by the unions, maybe there wouldn't have been this mass campaign, terror campaign against them to try to shut them up and drive them out. And, and that's really where the front line has been of, of struggle for workers' rights in the history of this country, um, has been in the struggle for national uh, liberation and for, for equality, racial equality, um, the, the struggle for immigrants' rights, as you're saying, um, the struggle against uh, police brutality. Um, I mean, going back to the national liberation movements in the 60s, Going back to the uh, the the organizing by A. Philip Randolph and um, this this has really been in the the, his, the history of the country the the greatest push for democracy the greatest push to to increase the rights of working people to be able to organize to be able to access public services to to bring uh, education healthcare to working class communities has come out of these struggles. So for the for the labor movement, for the union movement to sit on the sidelines while these historic uh, developments, you know, take place is, is really a betrayal, honestly. And the future, uh, we are in a dire situation, first time in my life, our lives, that we faced a, pand a world pandemic in which 800,000 people have died. I mean, millions could still die because uh, we don't have zero COVID as they do in China and Taiwan. I mean, where they are suppressing the disease, they're, they're shutting it down. Uh, workers are afraid. People are afraid for their families. People have seen their relatives die in this period when they didn't have to die. Um, despite that, you have optimism that working people can overcome and defend themselves and get organized to have a future uh, in this country and, and globally. Well, we will. And, you know this this is what history teaches us we will um uh the 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 
powers that that be right now, the the institutions and the agencies that are in control of these things right now are not going to solve these problems. They haven't solved them. Things have not uh, been been handled in the United States, as you're saying, the way that they have been in, in other places. But it will fall on workers ourselves to be able to uh, figure out how to mobilize how, how to arrange ourselves to be able to solve these problems because it, you know, it, it, it's our lives and our futures and our children, uh, you know, who, who depend on it. And there, there's nobody else that's going to solve these problems for us. So we will. Okay. Well, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we've been talking with Cliff Smith. He's a business manager of the roofers local in Southern California and has been fighting for equality, justice, and uh, for a labor party in the United States, and um, also against discrimination, racism, and for internationalism. So thanks for joining us on Work Week.